in this program, the very model of a modern art collector, the Italian woman who says contemporary art is the only art to which we can still be witness. I really think that in a certain way, a collection is like a fil rouge that unites the biography of the collector with the biography of the artist. In the shadow of the Alps, Turin is the great engine of Italy, traditional home of fiat and host to industry. It is not, I admit, the first place I think of when I think about art, least of all contemporary art. But one woman is making a life's work out of changing all that. In her office, Patrizia Sandretto Ray Rabadengo sits in front of a photograph of the city that means so much to her. She grew up in Turin, graduated from its university, and now is giving back as much as she received. This is the center of her world, a world that for almost 30 years has been about championing artists whose work she believes needs a wider audience. She's mad about modern art, the only art, she says, to which we can be witness. Patrizia has become a patron in the true sense of the word, a sort of modern day Medici. At the start of this century, she persuaded the Italian architect Claudio Silverstrin to design a huge gallery in downtown Turin. Here, she hosts exhibitions that move art forward. From videos making a commentary on the world today, to installations such as this by the German artist Hans-Peter Feldman. It marks the tragedy of the Twin Towers as reported on the front pages of 150 newspapers around the world one day later, 12th of September, 2001. Nine Twelve front page reminds us of the power of art to shock when brought together in this way. Every day the foundation is filled with tours. Students come not only from Turin, but also from other parts of Italy. They're being introduced to art in the making and to the mind of Patrizia Sandretto Ray Rabadengo. The space is fantastic for contemporary art. It's like a long, neutral, simple, linear, parallel pipe. Uh, when you enter on the right, there are all the exhibition rooms and on the left, there are all what needs for people. Because I know contemporary art is not easy and we don't want to make it easy, but we want to give the opportunity to everybody to understand. I really believe that art is important, obviously, for the art, for the artist, and it's very important to give them all the opportunity, all the occasion to produce new work, to be part 
on art. But at the same time, I really believe that art is a fantastic tool also to teach to everybody, to give to everybody the possibility to understand the world because art is really close to our life. All the artists, they try through their work to talk about issue, problem of the moment in which we live. And we really believe in that. And with my team, with all my staff, we work for art, for artists, for visitors, for everybody that will come and stay with us and understand what the artists they are trying to let us know. The Turin Foundation Building, with its fantastic overscaled gallery spaces, is evidence of Patrizia's commitment to modern art. It's the official side of her life, but I want to find out what she chooses to surround herself with at home. You're going to mug me? I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the decent marathon. Download Veli now. This, the private part of her world, is normally out of bounds, but she's agreed to let me see the hidden side of a woman who's become the very model of a modern art collector. How do you decide what stays at home on these beautiful walls and what doesn't, what goes to the foundation or travels? I have to say that I never bought a work to decorate my home. So often works are heavy, big, and so it's not easy to install a tom. And there are a few works that they are always a tom, like this Annette Messager, or other works like uh, um, this work of Joseph Kossuth on the top of the room. But generally, my collection travel a lot, and so work can stay some time at home, but they, they can move. And when they move, it's always it's made for me to leave them. And then it's always a fantastic thing to see them again in the museum and it's also an opportunity to live with different works and to try to change quite often in, in the house. And a bit of blank space might give you the inspiration for a new purchase. What appealed to you about this incredibly special work by Katja Noviskova? Katja is a fantastic artist. She was born in Estonia. She's very young. She was born in 1984 and she lives between Amsterdam and Berlin. And I discovered her in Berlin and I was really fascinated by her work and as we can see in this this work in this case is a series of animals I have to say that I have a little little zoo of work from Katia because I have a bat I have a cat I have a ibis I have I have a bird and uh, what I really I'm fascinated by her work that she's so open so so attentive what about is the meaning of images today images today is very important she's a, a, an artist working on internet and in this case as we can see in this but she used to take a photo uh, of animal from internet and then she used to print them on aluminium sheet and then to transfer them on cutout display and this is the result of her work how she's able to to talk about uh, uh, real world and virtual world uh, natural world and the digital world and i really believe that she will become uh, always more and more known as a young very interesting with women artists. Perhaps the biggest influence on this grand villa is that of the Italian artist Maurizio Catalan, who started life making wooden furniture, turned to art, and became known as the joker of the art world. But Catalan, who Patrizia has known and supported for years, is having the last laugh. One of his works sold at Christie's in 2016 for $17 million. This Galbani rug by Maurizio Catalan, this is a huge carpet um, on which Maurizio let us walk, so we can walk. On the, on the carpet. 
and uh, this is, is an edition of three, um, and this is the, but, but every one of the three have a different size. So this is the biggest size and is uh, three meters diameter. And uh, what you can see, it's uh, Formaggio Bel Paese, that is uh, the logo of the common use and cheese that exists in Italy. I mean, it's, not, it's, re, it's a real cheese called very Formaggio famous. Bel Paese, very famous, was much more famous in the past than now, but it's still a, a, an important cheese and a fantastic logo. And the Formaggio Bel, Bel Paese, Bel Paese means beautiful country, as is, is Italy, as should be Italy. And uh, I think that uh, what Maurizio, the fact that Maurizio tells us that we can walk on the carpet, maybe is because this is true, Italy is a beautiful country, but it's a country with a lot of problems because often Maurizio wants to talk about difficulty and in this case he's talking about mafia. Uh, when uh, he decided to realize this war, there was also a lot of problem in uh, political corruption, it was called manipulite, this moment. And uh, I really believe that he want to put together the concept of beautiful country, but a country that sometimes we, the Italian people, they don't respect. And the they country. walk over it. They don't like the country, they're not so respectful that we can walk on it. I'm and now, now we are we are in the north of Italy. You are Here's Turin, in, you're in Turin. Uh, Torino, yes, it's in the, we're in Torino, yes. Yeah. We are in Torino, you are much more close to, to Sardinia. Sardinia. We can exactly. go to Venice, to the Baia We can go to Venice, exactly. But so this, I think yeah. that it's a, a fantastic example of how uh, Maurizio Mm -hmm. try to, to talk about life, about issue, in a fantastic way. And a very po so clear and so direct. And so poignant that the Italians are potentially walking over this. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's such an interesting political statement, but such a tribute to you that you're taking an Italian artist who's making these commentaries very much of his time and really respecting the fact that he's created an artwork by artisans, Italian artisans yes. as well. And it's in your home. It's fascinating. And for future generations, what an iconic work of art. In Patrizia Sandretto Ray Rubberdengo's home, Maurizio Catalan's carpet is full of witty puns. But no one can fail to get the joke in a work by him just inside the front door. This is the artist as clown, perhaps in the Italian tradition of Commedia dell'arte, just hanging around on the coat rack. In We Are the Revolution, Catalan's mini-me is dressed in the felt suit that the late German artist Joseph Boys would have worn. It was Boys who said, every man is an artist. I saw in 2000, and you also had an exhibition in the Migros in Switzerland, in Zurich, and I saw this work and as an edition of three, I decided that I want to add one of this work in my collection. And I really like to have this work at home, it's really a part of my life. And in this sculpture, Maurizio, is Maurizio himself and reproduced as a puppet by Wax. The material is made of wax. And uh, the title of this work is the La Rivoluzione Siamo Noi, that is the We Are the Revolution, and uh, that comes from uh, an important work and photo of Joseph Boyce, in which uh, Joseph Boyce used to say, uh, look how we are, um, we are, the art is so important, art can change the world, can improve the world. And I noticed that he makes himself smaller than life here. It's not a big imposing image of himself he sort of he's hung himself up yeah. really um, with a rather sort of hangdog expression yeah. so again it's not imposing his thoughts or his presence on anyone it's a very yeah. subtle image as you come through your front door yes and then what I have to say that uh, I think that is like a modern gesture Maurizio always uh, in the situation to provoke us uh, to give us uh, to make us reflect uh, but in a nice way in with humour as you humor. come in through a the lot door. of humour. 
for Patrizia Sandretto Ray Rabadengo, Turin is home and home is Turin. Her house is an eclectic mix. Murano glass, including pieces from the famous Venini workshop. Paintings like Glenn Brown's Ariane 5 from 1997. Born in 1966, this British artist fools us into thinking he uses thick impasto when actually the effect is achieved through thin, swirling brushstrokes to create a new artistic language. And it really is upside down. On another wall in the salon, or rather part of the wall, is Tony Cragg's European Culture Myth Annunciation from 1984. In the 1980s, the art world couldn't get enough of Tony Scavenger Cragg and his post-industrial pieces. Born in Liverpool in 1949, he would have followed his father's trade as an electrical engineer, but went to art school instead. At the end of the 80s came a remarkable hat trick. He had a solo show at the Haywood, won the Turner Prize, and was chosen to represent Britain at the Venice Biennale. Sitting beneath Payne's Trans Ray Ray, part of the Weave series by the American artist Tauber Auerbach, born in San Francisco in 1981, Patricia explains how her life of collecting began. Everything started at the beginning of the 90s. In 1992, I went to London and I discovered a fantastic new world. I started visiting galleries and what was really so important for me, I started visit the art studio, the, the artist. And it was a fantastic experience. I remember the moment in which I met the artist, the moment in which I spoke with the galleries of the artist before buying uh, a work of art. So for me, really, to, to collect, uh, it's, uh, it's not only to buy, work of art, but it's important to buy the right works um, and not a name. My, I always say my collection is not a collection of names, it's a collection of works. And this I think that makes a difference in a collection because you really understand what you want to buy, what is important for your collection, um, what, uh, what can give the difference of your collection because I really believe that all the collector created fantastic collection and all the collection are so important and so different. But I really think that in a certain way, a collection is like a fil rouge that unites the biography of the collector with the biography of the artist. And this, every, for all of us, is different and all the collections are so different. Did you collect when you were a child? Collecting has always been a part of myself. I was in my DNA because when I was a young person, I used to collect uh, small pill boxes, all catalogued and numerated in my exercise book. Which collectors inspired you? Peggy Guggenheim, live. I have to say that I, I obviously I couldn't know her personally, but uh, I read a lot about her and she was fantastic. What she did was so fantastic. Then very close to me because it was in, she spent the last part of her life in uh, Venezia. Peggy Guggenheim for me was really fantastic uh, um, person and an icon in a certain way. As, uh, and she example, created a gallery, she had Herbert Mead yes, as because a great advisor. We, yeah. we go back to the, last, the past century, we really can see that uh, Women, women did so much for art, 
for the art. Because in a certain way, during the past century, uh, women couldn't uh, participate to the business life. Uh, and so they generally they used to do charity events. Uh, they used to, 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 do, um, to be involved in charity much more than in business. And I think that is for that if, for example, in America, in the past century, many museums started. Because if we think about uh, Isabella Stewart Garden, um, also the, the MoMA in New York. There are three women behind the MoMA in New York. And uh, Tate Modern has a new Tate, female ha Tate, head. Tate Modern, it's, a, it's a very interesting time. Guggen, but also the Guggenheim in New York, there was a Lorebi that was so important for, the, no, for this museum. So I really believe that uh, maybe in the past century women could not be part of the business world, but they did a so fantastic work for, for the art, for the museum. And also, and we have to go ahead in this direction. And I have to say that there are many women like me that like art, that are involved. Absolutely. And I think that this import is, is important to also to support our, our artists, female artists, because I have to say the truth that sometimes to be a female artist is a little bit much difficult than to be a man. How do you decide which art hangs in your home, which art hangs in the foundation? What happened, Tom, that, uh, as I say, my collection is not show, it's not in the fund at the Fondazione, but travels a lot. A part of the collection, for example, um, was in Quito, in Ecuador, some years ago, another part in, Santa, in Banco Santander in Madrid. Just a part of the collection was in the Sheffield Cathedral in some years ago. And now the collection in the next month will be at the Rockwell Museum in Shanghai. So the collection is traveling, and so often we have to move to change and to, to change also the works at home because some works have to leave. And I have to say that when the work leaves, I'm a little bit sad not to see the work, to disinstall. But then when I see my collection in the world, in nice museum, I'm so happy about that. And so at home, works change often. Uh, we, we change the, the works, uh, we remove. There are only a few works that uh, uh, we don't change, I don't change, uh, that for example the Tony Craig work here in the living room, that is a work that uh, is part of me, is, is always here, or in my uh, dining room there is a work of Alan McCollum that it's always in the dining room, or there is another work of Annette Messager that uh, it's so difficult also to disinstall that is a part of my life too. All the other work, they change, they move, and I try always to, to show young artists at home because I like to live with them. At the same time, I also think that it is an opportunity when people come to visit me to see new art. This is Patrizia Sandretto Ray Rabadengo as witness to modern art. As I've discovered in this series, great collectors have a passion for assembling things. In the case of Patrizia Sandretto Ray Rabadengo, it started with pill boxes. Later, in the galleries of London and New York, it turned into modern art. And then along came the foundation, a permanent place from which Patrizia could encourage new artists by financing specific projects. In 2011, for the 150 years of, of Italy, we decided to do a particular exhibition. Italy is divided in 20 regions. We invited 20 artists foreign artists, not from Italy, and each of them have to go to visit one of the region with a, with a curators. Then they come back and uh, they present it as a new project, a new work, and we, in this case, we produce 20 works, that means that we gave the money to the 20 artists to realize a new works. And then the 20 works have been shown in the Fondazione in an exhibition that that for us was an important moment, obviously, to show. Um, and often, instead, we invite a single artist with, with a project, and, and this is one way.
while she was emulating Peggy Guggenheim on the one hand and commissioning works of art on the other, Patrizia found time to collect costume jewellery, something that is not widely known. Would I like to see it? Yes, I would. So, while we discuss her life story, Patrizia's staff lays out a small part of one of the most unusual collections we've come across. A sidebar to the main story, and one that curiously tells the story of our time. Patriotic brooches made in America during the Second World War. Jewelry fashion from the plexiglass cockpits of discarded fighter planes after the war. Christmas trees sent by loving families to American troops in Korea in 1950. It's quite a surprise. I started collecting American costume jewelry at the end of the 80s. I went to Miami, uh, to a flea market, and I started to discover this fantastic object. And then a friend of mine, one day, that she was, she already collected this fantastic object, and she pinned onto my jacket uh, one of these. And for me, it was a fantastic new experience. And so I started collecting. And what I have to say that uh, after a lot of fear after some now i really understand that through this object you can read again in another way the history of of america because really all this object tell a story starting from this brooch that they they were being produced during the 40 uh, as you can say are all connected to to patriotic themes there is from uh, remember pearl harbor but also flag also object and they used to do to create this uh, this object to 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 say good luck to the soldier that started to go to fight for the second world war and women used to to wear on this dress just to say good luck to the soldier. They have to find new materials, and so, for example, they start to use wood, raffia, bakelite, uh, uh, plexiglass, like, for example, we can see in this object that are called jelly belly. Jelly belly from Trifari. Trifari was a very important uh, firm of costume jewelry, and uh, as you can see, are all flowers or animals, and all of them, they have the belt made by, by uh, lucite that they say that this lucite was used was the, as a window on the plane during the second world war after the war they removed from the plane and the recycled lucite. and recycled and they became the jelly belly or for example this fantastic christmas tree they are beautiful they are full of color they are very nice also to wear and generally the women used to wear on the coat, on the hat, during the 50, but they say that they, this fantastic Christmas tree they used to send to the soldier in Korea during the 50, during the Korea War, just to say, Epic like Christmas. a memento, exactly. remember me. To remember exactly yeah. during Christmas period. And so, for example, also this object, Wendy Gale, she's fantastic. I can say designer, and uh, she used to put everything. And really, in this object, you can also have the idea of recycle, because she used to, to use from plastic to raffia to wood to create this fantastic object. And man, yes, are fantastic. Look, this with the animal. <laughs> With the story, the, the, the little characters. sculptures, yes. aren't they? Like little, or, or little installations exactly. with all of the. Because, yes, exactly, because many, even in, during the Second World War for Russia problem, many uh, designers that were used living in Europe have to leave Europe to go to America and uh, they start 
to, to, or to produce, to realize this fantastic object. Rather like charm bracelets, they've got all of these little mementos that mean so much. Yes, and then there were some, for example, Miriam Askel, all these, all these necklaces, and many of them have never been produced, so are like prototype. And Miriam Askel, she was an entrepreneur, and uh, she, she never designed culture, but she's a fantastic designer, and together they used to go to buy big quantity of pearls in Japan, objects, then they used to stock this kind of material, and then producing new fantastic objects like this uh, necklace uh, or this brooch in which you see, and she used also to sell to Coco Chanel some of her object in her, on her production. And what I really like of this object, that they're producing huge quantity, they talk about 100 million pieces or so, really huge quantity, uh, but each one in a certain way is unique. And they are also called, the American costume jewelry are also called democratic jewelry because for the first time, women could buy, could or could buy, without asking to the husband or to um, the, the father to buy a, an object. So, yeah, so it's, it's affordable art as, exactly. as jewelry. Art. Exactly. And, and are there lots of collectors like you nowadays? You said that at the beginning it was very obtainable at flea markets. Yes. How, how has the market evolved? Uh, now it's a little bit more difficult to find pieces. There are lots of collectors. At the same time, more collectors. At the same time, now you can also buy by internet. So when I started, it was important to go to the market and to buy, and to find, and to know, because you have to pay attention, not to look at from the front, but also from the back, because on the back you understand how they sign, the, the quality of the object. So it's important also to, to be informed and to study and to know. But I mean, in the beginning, when I started, I really had to go and to find the pieces. Now, you can just buy internet. You can trust your eye, you trust your instincts shops online and so in a certain way is easier but obviously price grown a little bit so now are a little bit more expensive. Among this remarkable collection of costume jewellery, this is only a fraction of it, there is even a link to American royalty, the Kennedys. Some years ago Patrizia bought a necklace that copies one owned by Jackie Kennedy, the former First Lady. It may not be the real thing, but it's beautiful and interesting in its own right. Many factories were in Rhode Island, and uh, also an important museum was there, and the director of this museum, Peter de Christophorus, used to say that uh, um, a diamond is forever, a rhinestone is for everyone. And so give an idea that everyone really can buy this. And between, there is also this object, it is a fantastic necklace that is called Jackie. It's called Jackie because uh, um, Jackie received this real, with the real stone by Thronassis and uh, she decided to reproduce this in order to let it home, the original one, and to use this. And she went to Kenneth J. Lane, that was one of the most important designers that just died last year, and uh, Kenneth J. Lane asked uh, her if she wanted to, to give him the opportunity to, to reproduce, not only for her, but in many other copies, and she decided to do that, and so thanks to that, I have also my Jackie in my collection. privileged look inside the home of Patrizia Sandretto has helped us look into the mind of one of the leading collectors of our day. The costume jewellery that she loves is all of a piece with a woman who is perfectly turned out all the time. She chooses her jewellery at the start of every day before deciding what to wear. She's a perfectionist. 
What a treat it's been to enter her private world. I'm drawn back to the art of Maurizio Catalan, his carpet in the entrance hall, his effigy hanging on the coat rack, and though it's easily missed, Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo, made in 1996. Here is the enigmatic Catalan at his best. I'm intrigued to see at last this piece by Maurizio Catalan. I've longed to see it in person since I've seen illustrations of the 2012 Whitechapel exhibition. And I've only seen illustrations since. Nothing can prepare you for the sheer fragility of life that is conveyed when you see this poor squirrel on its small scale in the kitchen domestic interior. The title, Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo, couldn't be further removed from the magical transformation that that word gave Cinderella when her godmother whispered it. Here we have the poignancy of a squirrel in despair, perhaps an empty spirit glass, washing up uncompleted, and a yellow formica table is this the table of Maurizio Catalan's childhood that he remembers? And what about the gun? Who knows, he always leaves us to our own understanding of his artwork, but without question, he creates such a moving sculpture and work of art from which we can all take our own poignant message. And that's the way he wants it. It's this reveling in the meaning of modern art, particularly its humor, that makes meeting Patrizia so entertaining. Her energy is remarkable. She travels for most of the year. She's building a new foundation in Madrid. She spent some of her childhood in Spain and is still collecting a thousand pieces and rising. What about your family? Are they involved in the collection? Uh, my family, they like, my husband love arts, obviously, and also my two, I have two sons that they also love art. For example, my older son, Eugenio, that lives in London, and uh, after studying management and business, he decided to, to, to to, he loved art so much as me that he decided to, to create a platform to sell contemporary art online. So this, and this for me is a fantastic because it's also an occasion to, to talk with him, to, to discover new artists, to be much more close to the new generation. And also my other son, Emilio, that lives in Torino, loves art obviously, and is involved in the Fondazione. And so we are a family that really, we love art. And in fact, uh, in summer, uh, now my son are older, but when we, they, they were younger, we used to, to spend our summer visiting museum and also beaches, but I mean, museum has always been part of my life and also their life. And uh, I think that uh, it's fantastic to live with the artist and with the art. And uh, in a certain way, I've been so lucky that I could meet many artists, that I really uh, thought some years ago that I wanted to give back what I receive from them. And I really hope that my, my son will, that they love already, but we love so much art that they will go ahead in my same direction in the next year. And I really hope that this is the future of the collection and maybe why not also my house. It's quite a story, a family story, that through her foundation, Patrizia hopes will endure.